I'm going to get us started um, as people trickle in. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, I think we've got a really great program, some really cool panelists to learn from. Um, so I'm really excited to learn as well. My name is Sam. I am the Director of Audience Experience at Yale Climate Connections. Um, my colleague, Sarah Peach, our senior editor, uh, is here with us today, too. Um, hi. Uh, for those of you who are new to us, uh, Yale Climate Connections is an online site and a daily radio program uh, that provides original reporting, commentary, and analysis on the issue of climate change. Uh, we know that climate change is a major challenge and can be uh, quite overwhelming for us as individuals. So we really aim to be a space where you can get trustworthy information that helps you navigate our changing world. Um, so with that said, today we're going to be talking about wildfires and specifically about how they impact our health. Uh, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, as I mentioned, it will be posted online and I will send out a link to everyone once that has been done. Um, we'll end today after panelists have presented with a Q&A session. Uh, so do drop questions into the Q&A throughout the conversation. I will be monitoring those. Uh, we won't be able to get to everything, but we'll try and cover the topics that seem top of mind to people and important. Um, I now am going to uh, turn it over to our generous moderator, Dr. Kai Chen. Uh, Dr. Chen is an assistant professor of epidemiology, environmental health, uh, director of research for climate change and health, and affi affiliated faculty at the Yale Institute for Global Health. Dr. Chen's research focuses on the intersection of climate change, air pollution, and human health. Thanks, Sam, uh, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. For, uh, uh, thank you for joining us today. We have uh, amazing panelists um, uh, giving us this talk, talking about the Wi-Fi and our house today. So um, without further ado, let me introduce them to, uh, to you. Our first speaker will be Mankuel Maskery. She's a tribal citizen of Nambi Owinga, and she will discuss how the Wi-Fi's that um, their community has been experiencing and how they have taken care of one another. So without further ado, Mankuel. Thank you, Kai. Appreciate that introduction. Um, yeah, and just some just some general information. So about me, um, my name is Mark Helmusgrave. Um, I use they, them, and she, her pronouns. Um, like Kai mentioned, I'm a tribal citizen of the Pueblo of Nambe, um, also a community organizer. Um, and for this conversation and telling this story, I think it's important for me to share that I'm a person who's lived with asthma my whole life, since I can remember. Um, so that recognition of being sensitive to kind of the quality of the air that I'm in, I've had to be aware of my whole life. Um, so I will I will get started in telling this story. Um, it's one that I wish, you know, we didn't have to tell, but we have a lot of um, learning to do from, from those most impacted. And so I hope that this helps and influences uh, folks to know what to do to become prepared and how to support those who are most vulnerable um, as you know, everything intensifies in terms of the climate crisis. All right, let me get my screen share here. Okay. All right. So I have here what we're gonna what I'm gonna discuss, just the health impacts uh, of New Mexico wildfires in the last couple of years, um, the impacts on indigenous frontline communities, uh, and our responses in terms of mutual aid and clean indoor air mitigation tools. Um, and here we go. So in, oh, sorry, were you gonna say something? Oh, okay, thanks. Um, so we have here the, um, at the beginning um, to tell this story, we um, had the Medio Fire start in 2020 in Tewa Lands, uh, also known as the Sangre de Cristo Mountains near Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, it started, August 17th and uh, ran through um, for 28 days, burning 4,000 acres of sacred land. I 
realize now that <laughs> I wasn't supposed to jump into my presentation. Um, so do we want to go back, Sam? No, you can keep going. Okay. All right. And then we'll give everybody a chance to intro after me. Um, okay. Uh, all right. And some of the impacts that we saw were um, people with asthma, especially people with COPD and other upper respiratory issues uh, were triggered um, by daily smoke um, that, you know, lasted uh, for in this the initially for 28 days in the 2021 in our community. Um, but as you all know, wildfires can last for months at a time. Um, those who had the means and support to leave the state did, but many people financially um, could not. Um, in New Mexico, one in 10 adults and one in three, thir one in 13 children have asthma. Um, that's for a number of reasons. Uh, New Mexico has been considered a sacrifice zone uh, to the US uh, for many years in terms of nuclear colonialism, um, uranium mining, uh, and the oil boom that's happened in the last 10 years, uh, and the, the methane from the Permian Basin. Um, we saw lots of headaches, coughing, wheezing, irritated eyes, inflammation of the respiratory systems. Um, and then in our area, many homes are cooled by, uh, by open air, just like windows in the summer. And so many of them are old adobe homes or they don't have like central air, central cooling systems. Um, so it took some um, community education and uh, mutual aid to get cooling systems into homes um, to make sure that people could seal their homes up and stay comfortable inside. Um, so those were needed. And then also during this time, it was in 2020, as we all know, we were navigating um, the onset, the first year of the pandemic. Um, and so this, the pandemic exacerbated the crisis and in terms of thinking about, you know, how we move forward with climate crisis and ongoing pandemics, um, we had to think through the many layers and challenges with that. Um, indigenous populations have the highest rates of asthma out of any population um, and also were the most impacted by COVID with uh, life expectancy dropping for indigenous populations by 6.6 .6 years since 2020. So um, I started just buying air purifiers. Um, and I, as somebody who's who needed an air purifier and was just, you know, trying to help my um, my elders and people in my community that I saw, I just started purchasing them. And then it turned into I um a, I got support from Three Sisters Collective, who's a, a grassroots organization here in New Mexico, who helped with that growing need. And so we were and we were able to get air purifiers, cooling units um, to the most vulnerable in the community, uh, which were like elders, infants, uh, people with respiratory issues. And then um, we purchased as much as we could and we got donations, but because of low inventory in the state, um, we also had to think through how do we DIY air purifiers. And so initially in 2020, um, we did some research and, and we knew that you could place, you know, a single furnace filter on a box fan and that could serve as an air purifier. And so we made a number of those um, out of necessity. Eventually, the tribe will take over um, the mutual aid uh, distribution and they were able to, and they purchased more to make sure that everybody in the community did have uh, air purifiers or cooling units as needed. Um, and during this time, I was also homeschooling my little one. And so I just want to mention too that it's also really important to talk about, you know, that children are impacted um, in these really, you know, they're most impacted by climate change and are going to be inheriting what we give them. Um, sorry. <laughs> this just makes me a little emotional. Um, yeah, because this is, uh, this is kind of where, yeah, where we're at. This is where we're at. Um, and so with my little one, 
Um, we went over value systems in homeschool, um, vocabulary words, um, kind of created a whole curriculum out of mutual aid. Um, and so she was able to teach uh, CR, how to make CR boxes and um, how to organize. Um, she was learning all of these critical skills um, that she shouldn't have to learn, but are necessary for this time. Also on the side here um, is a text message from one of the elders um, just thanking, thanking us for, for organizing and supporting everyone. Okay. So after that, um, we had some experience in, in knowing what we needed um, to kind of to survive really the smoke in particular. Um, and in 2021, um, we had marched to the White House in DC along with the people's, uh, the people versus fossil fuels action and made a lot of um, connections with other frontline communities there. Um, in 2022, um, we had the largest wildfires in New Mexico state history. So the Calf Canyon and Hermit's Peak wildfires, both started by the US Forest Service, um, were started as prescribed burns. Um, they became, they merged, um, burning 341,000 acres and ran from April to August of this year. The Black Fire became the second largest burning. And we had a number of fires happening at the same time in the state where we're located in the, um, we're in the Tewa Basin, as we call it. Um, and so it's kind of, it's a bowl essentially. Um, and we have all of our, our sacred mountains in all four directions. And we had fires burning in all four directions. Um, and the way that smoke kind of, because of the geography, the landscape, the smoke kind of, you know, settles in, into that bowl. Um, so it was just, even more intense than the 2021 and more communities were impacted in Northern New Mexico. Um, in Las, closer to the fire where the fire burned, there was over a thousand structures that were destroyed. People were displaced, thousands were displaced. Um, but in my community, it was mainly the, the smoke that we were navigating directly. Um, so what we did, uh, during this time also, right, we had COVID-19 and so we were looking at ways to support um, the most vulnerable with COVID and looking at ways to uh, better ventilate, filter the air, uh, provide community, community education to keep people safe um, in terms of wearing proper fitting, well-sealed masks. Um, and we learned about the CR box or the Corsi Rosenthal box um, a little bit before this time. And we knew that um, this could be a really great tool for us um, in terms of having an option that is you know, we could have, it's economically sound, we could access the materials, easily teach people to create them. Um, and so we got funding from uh, Indian Collective at the time to support us getting these supplies and just mobilized. Um, at the time, it was with the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women. And so we ran a uh, a distribution and some uh, community education campaigns on social media to support um, with just information. Um, here on the bottom, there's a photo of uh, Trenton DeVore, one of the youth organizers with uh, Pueblo Action Alliance. I serve on the board of director directors for Pueblo Action Alliance as well. Um, and to support all of these youth who are really at the forefront of fighting for um, fighting for the future of a restoration of balance for our communities in the land here in New Mexico. And so here's some examples of the um, campaigns that we that we did and we shared um, some actions to take in the home and um, just information for for community to be aware of that really wasn't happening from the state. Um, there was information on like, you know, evacuations and where to go in the evacuation shelters. There was no air purifiers. There was no CR boxes. There was no um, 
monitoring of the CO2 levels inside the shelters. There were masks that were offered, um, they but they weren't like you know mandated. So for many elders and um, you know compromised relatives and people, um, you know who are trying to stay alive and not get smoke inhalation issues and also COVID, um, the shelters weren't really, you know, they weren't really a safe place. Um, and so we just did our best to support with the information that we did know at the time. Um, here's some, yeah, pictures of our distribution, some other community leaders that, you know, took what we, the kind of the seed that we planted and, and took it out um, to also share and distribute. Uh, eventually, Table Women United, another grassroots organization, uh, took on efforts of their own and got more CR boxes, CR box kits, and some workshops to community. Um, here I have a photo of a CO2 monitor that we were using um, just to show the so we can uh, help navigate and know the level of like ventilation um, in each space to make sure that that, um, yeah, that places were well ventilated. It's a good tool just to be aware of, you know, how, how much airflow um, or ventilation is in a space. And then here's an example of our, uh, another community education campaign. So just some information about the fire. I think we made this one around May. Um, and do name, you know, what is causing, why is this happening? The root, the root causes of colonialism, extractive industry. Um, we know why it's happening, where it's coming from. And I do want to say that um, mitigation tools are tools of survival and they're not necessary, so necessarily the solution. They're just how we get through it for right now. Hey, Markel. We're getting close to time if you... Thank you so much. Okay, thanks for that. Um, yeah, and so here we shared um, many resources on how to make CR boxes, um, where to buy filters, for folks that we, you know, we if we didn't have the supplies um, and clean air crew, which I think somebody else is going to mention um, later on, um, was really critical and helpful in us being able to share uh, resources for people. Yeah, and um, even in 2022, also President Biden came to visit the state um, during these record-breaking wildfires. Um, and we organized, uh, I believe 12 organizations came together to, um, to call for a, uh, for President Biden to declare a climate crisis um, and work towards the rematriation of our lands back to indigenous stewardship. Thanks, Michael. Uh, thanks for sharing this very, um, um, first-hand experience with this and as one of the audience that is we appreciate you being emo emotional and it reminds us all that the impact of wi-fi is not just numbers it's real life real real impact uh, so speaking of the impact i think michael mentioned some experience um um you know respiratory diseases but what are other health impacts so with that i will bring our second panelist um dr colin Reid. Uh, she's an assistant professor of geology at the University of Colorado Boulder. She will uh, speak about what we know about the health impacts of Wi-Fi. So, Colleen. Great, thank you. Um, so, here we go. I'm going to actually, no, nope, that's not the right screen. <laughs> I'm going to share the right screen here. Um, all right, excellent. Um, so I am a professor of geography at the University of Colorado Boulder, um, and a lot of my work is on epidemiological studies of the health impacts of wildfire smoke. And I'm going to try to give a state of the science today on this topic. Um, here we go. So first, I want to talk about what is emitted from wildfires. So there's lots of air pollutants that are caused through the combustion process. 
releasing lots of air pollutants that we call primary air pollutants because they're released through the actual combustion process. But then additionally, those pollutants can interact with each other chemically in the air, as well as with other um, air pollution in the air, creating what we call secondary air pollutants. And the air pollutant that's most been studied within wildfire smoke is particulate matter, which is what I'm going to focus on today. But there is a need to look at these other components of smoke and whether those are playing a role in the health impacts that have been seen related to wildfire smoke. So particulate matter is all the solid and liquid particles that are too small to settle out with gravity. They stay suspended in the air. And normally we talk about PM 2.5, which means all particles that are 2.5 microns or smaller in aerodynamic diameter. So just to give you a sense of how small that is, this is an image from the EPA where if we were to take a bunch of particles that are exactly 2.5 microns, we could fit about 20 across the width of a human hair. So very, very tiny particles. Um, and actually in wildfire smoke, the, the mode, the most common size of the particles is about PM1, so about one micron in diameter. So very, very small particles. And the reason we're concerned about these small particles is that those are the ones, the smaller the particles are, the deeper they get into the lungs, which can lead to some of the health impacts that we're concerned about. When I look at the studies of the health impacts of wildfires to date, we're really just getting at the tip of the iceberg because most studies have to rely on data sets that are regularly collected. So if we think about all people exposed to wildfire smoke, probably everyone experiences some subclinical effects that they may not even notice, right? There could be some changes in their lung function or in their heart rate variability, but those never show up at a doctor's office such that they're recorded, that we can know that they're happening, that we can then see if they're attributable to the wildfire smoke. Then there's actually, you know, a smaller subset who's a little bit more susceptible um, might experience symptoms that they notice. And for people who have um, pre-existing <laughs> health conditions, they might increase their medication usage. So you could have respiratory or cardiovascular symptoms. And then you get up to people who actually experience such symptoms that they are concerned enough that they show up at a medical center. And so often we're just looking at these ones that they're showing up either in an emergency department, urgent care, physician visits, or potentially being hospitalized or dying that we can attribute to the deaths. And so the total impact is much larger. There are some research going forward to try and capture some of that um, symptoms or um, or even subclinical symptoms, but most of the research to date has been focused on this tip of the iceberg. So we know that we breathe in the smoke, and so it doesn't, it's not surprising to most people that it can affect the respiratory system. But when we look at the evidence, almost every study that has looked at asthma exacerbations, meaning someone showing up to their doctor or the emergency room with symptoms of asthma, related to wild, we see that there is a relationship with wildfire smoke in every study that has tried to examine whether there's a relationship. With um, some of those studies also try to look at lung function. And interestingly, the studies that find impacts on lung function are normally show a significant effect among people who do not already have been diagnosed with asthma and less so among people who do have asthma. And the theory there, which still needs to be explored further, is that people who have asthma likely are using their medication and therefore offsetting some of that lung function decline. So we have impacts on people who already have asthma as well as people who don't already have asthma in terms of their respiratory health. And then additionally, almost all studies that look at people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, we do see impacts of wildfire smoke on, on them more likely to show up in emergency rooms and or get hospitalized due to exposure to wildfire smoke. There's also been some interesting studies recently looking at whether wildfire smoke affects the risk of respiratory infections. This is from a study from the University of Montana um, where they looked and they saw a significant association between wildfire smoke in a summer and, and um, influenza the following winter. Um, I know that that group is following up on this with more work. I also want to additionally say that there's a very interesting study that came out in the past, um, in the past year that um, documents that there, when they look at cases of um, diagnosed tuberculosis in California, most of those cases were exposed to wildfire smoke um, <laughs> soon before that, ex before being diagnosed such that there could be a link with these respiratory infections. 
In terms of looking into wildfire smoke and cardiovascular disease, when we look at this specifically for wildfire smoke, the studies are very mixed. Some studies find that there is an association between wildfire smoke and um, cardiovascular disease outcomes, and some find that there is not an association. However, we do know that PM2.5 generally, not just from wildfire smoke, can affect cardiovascular disease through a variety of biological pathways shown in this image on the right um, from an article by Brooke. I won't go into all the specific details there, but if you're interested, take a look at that. Um, but the reason why we're not seeing it with wildfire smoke could be because some of the studies on wildfire smoke have been for relatively short-lived wildfire smoke, such that it's such a short exposure that people, if they can get through it, um, they then can recover. And some of the more newer studies that have found the evidence, maybe it's that the exposures are longer. There's also possible differences by wildfire in terms of the toxicity of the smoke, um, but also could be differences in due to the study methodology or the underlying population vulnerability in terms of underlying health conditions in the populations. And so lots of researchers are trying to answer this question with more studies, but we do expect that there could be an impact, especially as wildfire smoke becomes um, more common. Additionally, there's studies looking at mortality, and these are often in places that are experiencing wildfire smoke every wildfire season. So this is an example from a study in Washington state. There's also studies from Australia and from European countries showing that all cause mortality does increase within a few days after exposure to, to high wildfire smoke. We've also seen some studies that show evidence where um, children who are in the womb during wildfire smoke events um, are more likely to be born with lower birth weights and or preterm. This is one study on low birth weight. There's also um, a study from Colorado showing that as well as showing some impacts on the health of the mother that could be part of the pathway by which the, the, the child is impacted. And then I think that there needs to be more studies on the mental health impacts of wildfire smoke. A lot of the studies that have been done to date are focused on populations that have been um, evacuated or lost property or loved ones and the follow-on um, sort of post-traumatic experiences of that on mental health. And But I also think that there's increasingly a concern about just smoke impacting mental health. This is from a study in Canada where they interviewed residents of some First Nations communities talking, uh, and the, the quotes from this is a qualitative study, and I think it really brings out this lived experience of smoke impacting people's mental health, right? This one says, I think people were more isolated because they were, were not out working in their gardens. That really impacts community and community cohesion. Another quote states that um, it's like we didn't have a summer Usually we get outside and we enjoy being in the North. We enjoy the environment. We enjoy everything that's outside, but they lost that that summer because the smoke lasted pretty much the whole time of the summer and that affects them emotionally and mentally. And I think that this is um, something that needs to be studied further about the mental health impacts, not just of evacuation and lost property and loved ones, but also um, just smoke impacting people's daily lives and impacting their um, their sense of their sense of place and their sense of the environment. So then another question is which populations are most affected? I put in this um, figure, it's from a great website that um, gives you air quality across the US related to fires. Um, this is from a couple of years ago showing some large fires in the Western US, but the fact that the smoke plume was really spreading across the, the continent. And, and so from that, I'm trying to say that smoke can really impact large areas and lots of different people, but that's getting just at the outside concentrations. And when we think about differential exposure, people who have outdoor jobs um, and who maybe don't have control over their ability to spend time outdoors, for example, agricultural workers in California that have been told to save the crops from the smoke and are not allowed to, you know, be to not show up for work um, or fear of retribution or lost wages. There's also the fact that we know that homes that are less well-maintained um, such are much more leaky. So newer homes or rental properties are much more leaky to um, outdoor air and therefore more smoke gets inside. 
So that there are individuals who have less ability to control their smoke exposure than others, similar to what was in the previous presentation by Markel. And so in looking at this across studies, I think there needs to be a lot more research into the differential impacts so that we can identify populations that are more at risk and try and um, get more interventions to those populations. There's interesting trying to, we would imagine that the elderly are more impacted than adults or youth. And, um, but across, this is from an, a meta-analysis where they looked at a bunch of studies that looked at these differences and they, they basically found that there were too few studies that had looked at differential impacts of wildfire smoke at that point in time. And that it was hard to say that there, which populations were more affected when looking across studies. So for example, in addition to age, they also found that when looking at differences by um, sex or gender, we found mi they found mixed evidence. Um, too few studies have looked at differences by various metrics of socioeconomic status, and especially the, the studies that have been done look at different measures. Um, some looking at education, some at income, some at different ways of measuring income. And then ve very few studies have looked at differential impacts of wildfire smoke on health by race and ethnicity. And so if you'd like to look into any of these studies that I've referenced here, I provide reference lists. And with that, I will stop and um, say thank you. Thank you very much for calling. Uh, so we have learned from Colin's talk that the, indeed the health impacts are beyond just respiratory health and even from physical health to mental health. Um, all the impacts we've seen right now is for what's already happening. So what does climate change has a role in Wi-Fi and how it's gonna change us? That brings us our third panelist, Dr. Jeff uh, Masters. Um, Jeff is a meteorologist and a very regular contributor at the Yale Climate Connections. And he will discuss the meteorology of Wi-Fi and how climate change is expected to affect them. So Jeff. Thank you, Dr. Chen. I also happen to have a PhD in air pollution meteorology, although mostly I write about hurricanes and extreme weather. So it's nice to be able to chat about air pollution. So uh, let me show you my new toy. This is called a uh, TEM top PM 2.5 monitor, T-E-M-T-O-P. I got it from Amazon for 40 bucks. And it shows you the AQI, uh, you know, 100 is bad because you uh, are exceeding the federal standard or it also shows you in the micrograms per cubic meter what your PM 2.5 levels are. So this little gizmo, you know, it's good for a first guess at, you know, what the actual air is you're breathing as far as it's uh, PM 2.5 loading. And uh, I take it in my car and I've been experimenting around with, uh, you know, the recirc on the car to see if it reduces the air pollution levels, it seems to. Um, Showers seem to put some aerosols in the air, cooking, blowing out birthday candles. For 40 bucks, you, know, you can't go wrong. I mean, it lasts about six hours on a charge or you can just leave it plugged in. So uh, I'm gonna start uh, toting this around and you know, seeing what I see in restaurants and so on. So you might consider that for monitoring your air pollution levels. And if you're talking about outside air pollution, I've had this gizmo, it's called a purple air, PM 2.5 monitor. Uh, I had it for about eight years and it finally failed. It's got uh, two little infrared lasers in there which measure the PM 2.5 levels. And it actually, it measures about 40% too few, 40% uh, low on PM 2.5 in wildfires. But they actually use these in uh, peer reviewed studies. About 260 bucks from purpleair.com. Uh, they have a whole you know, web page you can go to where there's thousands of people that have these in their backyard. So if you want permanent monitoring capability, I recommend purpleair.com. Portable, eh, maybe try this Tem top, 40 bucks, pretty good. Uh, also, I might go and talk about Corsi Rosenthal boxes like uh, Markel was talking about. We actually made a little portable one just out of a furnace filter, duct tape, and a little fan that has a little USB port here and I can take this to the movie theater and run it next to me in the theater. It's good for uh, COVID protection too. Um, in my final slide, I've got references to some of this stuff and you can go check that out. So let me uh, share my screen here and I will start up my presentation. 
Uh, let's see here. Where's my gizmo uh, keynote? Uh, okay. Okay, are you seeing my slide there? Yes. Okay. So uh, here we go. We're going to dive right in here. So 2022 has been uh, a pretty barn burner year for wildfires if you live in Alaska or New Mexico. And uh, one of the more active years in the past uh, 25 or so in the U.S. And this is a shot showing uh, over the last 20 or so years, the burned area in the Western US just for three states. And you can see cumulatively the yellow regions uh, uh, expanding quite a bit. We've seen a lot of wildfire activity, that's for sure, in the last 20 years. And if you look at the actual emissions by satellite, in the US, we've seen a couple record years in the last five years. Be no surprise to anybody living out West. So we've made a lot of progress on air pollution in the US in the last you know, 50 years since the Clean Air Act came into being. But just in the last 20 years, some of that progress has really reversed due to wildfire smoke. In the, U, in the Western US, wildfires are now about 50% of all of our PM 2.5, which incidentally is the most deadly form of air pollution. Uh, ozone is also deadly, but PM 2.5 is thought to cause roughly 90% of all air pollution deaths. So, well, what's causing all this wildfire in the Western US? The climate has gotten drier and hotter. You can see since 1895, the top graph in the June through September warm season, we've been experiencing a number of record hot years in recent years. And also, if you look at the drought index, the lower curve here, the climate has been drying. So it's really not accurate to say that there's a drought going on in the West. It's more a permanent aridification. It's getting more desert-like. And that's a trend that's expected to continue due to climate change. In fact, uh, if you looked at drought plot, five of the top 10 driest years on record in the Western US have been in the last 10 years. Now, if you compare the past five or so years to about uh, 15 years ago or so, this is where you see the biggest change in wildfire smoke. So in red, in micrograms per cubic meter, you're seeing where the big increases are. And it's obvious if you live in California, Oregon, Washington, those are the hotspots. And if you wanna look at extreme days, I show some numbers down there. If you've got at least one day where you hit the various levels of air quality index, orange, red, or purple, you can see, um, in the most recent five-year period, a factor of four increase in the number of people experiencing the orange level for at least one day, factor 27 increase for the red level, the very unhealthy or the unhealthy level, and then a factor of 11,000 increase for the purple level. Uh, really, a serious sort of air pollution episodes with an AQI over 250. So that's an incredible expansion of dangerous air quality due to wildfire smoke in recent decades. I never would have thought that, uh, you know, this sort of climate change impact would become so severe so fast, and it's a real concern. And it's also a concern because more people are moving into wildfire-prone areas, the wildland-urban interface, as we call it. 
So not only is our vulnerability increasing, also wildfire smoke's increasing too. And the two are combining to really create a serious health emergency. So California has seen a five factor increase in burned area in recent decades. And that's primarily thought to be due to increased temperatures, which we can trace to global warming. Also, the rainy season has been shortening and being delayed, also thought to be a climate change influence. This is the view in Seattle this summer. Normally, you can see Mount Rainier. But back on October 20th, just two weeks ago, that was the view from the same camera. They had a horrible air pollution episode. And here's what the EPA map looked like. You're seeing some uh, hazardous levels there of air pollution, the brown colors due to wildfire smoke. And what was causing that? Well, this is a map of the jet stream in uh, the Northern hemisphere for that period, actually a couple of days prior. And you're seeing some really sharp loops in the jet stream, very unusual sort of intense fluctuations that we've been seeing increasingly so in recent decades. Again, this is thought to be a climate change influence. And there have been some very notable extremes that have occurred in recent decades when the jet stream starts showing this behavior. It's thought that Arctic sea ice loss might be driving some of this unusual jet stream behavior where you get a very sharp ridge of high pressure that settles in place over the Western US, causing an extended period of hot and dry weather. And that, of course, exacerbates wildfire extremes. Here's one from 2020, one of the worst episodes ever for wildfires in the Western US, again, due to one of these crazy jet stream excursions. And we had one last year, similar sort of jet stream craziness, where you had a massive heat wave and wildfire event in the Western US that caused over a thousand deaths primarily due to wildfire smoke, but also just due to heat. Well, what's the forecast for the future? This is the global outlook for um, wildfire smoke. You're seeing in red there places where we, see to, where we expect to see a, a significant increase in burned area and thus wildfire smoke. Of course, the Western US is gonna be a hotspot, Alaska, but there's areas in all the continents where you're going to be seeing more burned area and thus more wildfire smoke. So we better do something about it. <laughs> we better stop burning so many fossil fuels and heating our climate up. Uh, almost 9 million premature air pollution deaths are thought to be occurring due to burning of fossil fuels. And that air pollution death tally is just going to rise when we start adding in wildfire smoke to the mix. But there is hope for the future. The uh, clean er energy revolution is here. Look at these uh, plummeting costs for both uh, solar and wind. Uh, this is a trend that we're going to continue to see. And I'm optimistic that we are going to turn the corner in, uh, in just a few years or decades. And stop burning so many fossil fuels and thus emitting so much wildfire smoke in, in the process. So here are some of the resources that I mentioned during the talk, which I encourage you to go check out. Uh, sensors, um, cleanaircrew.org, if you wanna learn how to build your own Corsi Rosenthal box. Uh, that one I showed you was only like 10 bucks, or if you want a full scale one, maybe 30 bucks with four filters and a box fan. And then I also give you my three favorite masks that I like to wear there both for COVID and for wildfire smoke. So that's it. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Chen. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for uh, sharing the kind of responses from individual level, how we can purchase, you know, uh, uh, personal monitors for, uh, and also purifies to a society level as how we end, uh, can, you know, help mitigate climate change. So with that, uh, we have about 15 minutes left for Q&A. And we do have a lot of questions actually before the uh, uh, web webinar began from the registration page. So I will start with one of the um, questions from the registration page saying that, when I tell my PCP I invested a lot of Wi-Fi smoke and would like a long screening, they change the subject and say it's not necessary. 
what suggestion do you have for activating the medical institutions and medical providers in our areas about the health effects of climate change? So I guess we can go to Colin first, then if any other panelists can jump in. Um, thanks for that question. There has been a lot of effort to try to get the message out to physicians. However, obviously can't reach everybody. There is, uh, there's a lot more medical schools that are training their new medical graduates on climate change and health. There's a consortium on climate change education that's doing so within uh, medical schools, school, schools of public health, schools of nursing. Um, and then also I've been on many panels uh, talking about this issue with um, physicians. And I think that there's a lot of other researchers who are doing that, but I, I know it's not enough. I guess um, I'm sure that the, I, I think that, you know, pointing them towards resources about the health impacts of wildfire smoke and the important and the fact that it is associated with a lot of health outcomes could be possible. And there's um, some, you know, there's some um, information on that on the EPA's website, on the CDC's website, on the WHO's website that's related to wildfire smoke and health that possibly might um, get those medical professionals um, more in tune with, with the risks of wildfire smoke. I don't know if others have things that they would recommend in there too. Well, if not, then um, I, I guess we can move on to the next question. Next question is also kind of related to health. So uh, one of the questions from the Q&A, uh, it says, have studies been done looking at similar health effects from backyard or residential yard waste burning? Uh, I I don't know of any, um, but I know that there, among the researchers that I work with, there has been concern about this, particularly in the global south, where people do burn their trash a lot more than they do in the United States, um, and an effort to try and measure the air pollution from that and or um, estimate and model that to try and look at the health impacts. But um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm off the top of my head, I do not have a paper to um, put you in touch with, but I bet um, some searches through Google Scholar or PubMed might might tell you whether or not those studies have been done. I do know that leaf burning is bad news, especially when it occurs in the late afternoon, right before the evening inversion settles in. I've measured AQIs in the red zone unhealthy all night because of leaf burning in my local area. Um, thanks, Jeff. Actually, the next question is, is for you. So um, the, um, regarding your slide on the forecast of the future, is the first the audience has seen related to the predicting amount of smoke in future decades. Uh, the question is, is smoke forecasting a relatively new field of study? There, as far as short-term forecasting of smoke goes, that is relatively new. Just last year, there was a new model that was made operational called the HRRR smoke, the high resolution rapid refresh model for smoke. And it only goes out like eight or so hours in the future, but it's been really good at predicting where smoke is gonna go. So it is a new field. As far as long-term forecasts of smoke, I don't think we're there yet, but, uh, it is heartening to see this new model come online. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, and we have another question for Marquille. Actually, uh, it's uh, from the registration page. So have you observed population migration in response to the Wi-Fi, particularly for the First Nation or indigenous population? And how have lifestyle have changed, including business or activity uh, disruptions? Yeah, there is incredible um, disruption um, and also consideration of, of migration. You know, we have been here in these lands uh, for thousands and thousands of years in New Mexico, actually, uh, most recently, um, I believe in 2021. Um, I don't know if you read about um, the footprints that they found in white, the White Sands area dating back over 23,000 years. Some folks um, who are part of that project um, have told me it was around 29,000 years. Um, and so my people have been here um, that long. Um, so migration, and we have moved throughout the, the Southwest at different points in time around the Chaco Canyon area, Mesa Verde, 
um, those are where ancestral people um, had homes. Um, but um, we, yeah, I, you know, we've needed to move when we've needed to move, but it was, it was never as, as a result of, you know, harm that we were doing to the environment. Um, and so um, for now, we are fighting back um, and we're hoping for a return of, of land stewardship um, for us to preserve and restore balance um, to the environment in the ways that we care for the land, in the ways that we prevent um, destruction like this. Uh, and yeah, we hope to move away from, from the immense um, fracking and growing of the oil and gas industry in the state of New Mexico that's happened in the last 10 years. Um, we're hoping for, for a shift and change to do that. Um, it, you know, being inside, it was really hard during COVID. Um, one, because, you know, we had to, we were isolated for one and we found refuge or, you know, the ability to be outside with our, uh, with Mother Earth and our, you know, non-human relatives. And we weren't able to do that with wildfire smoke. It was unsafe to be outside. It was unsafe to be in community. Um, we really were you know, brought down into isolation, really just in our homes and trying to filter the air inside. Um, and so that, that is just it, incredibly hard, um, incredibly stressful um, for, for our community and for our families. And it, you know, and we're willing to continue to fight this fight so other people don't have to go through this. Thanks, Michael. I think, um... In Michael's study um, um, experience, uh, one of the very touching stories about you know, the impacts on children. And there's a question from audience curious about what's the lifetime exposure risk for the children growing up with these annual fires. Um, and the audience says um, he or she has heard concerns about toxins uh, across the blood brain barriers. Is that true? Um, I get this question a lot from from parents, um, and I'm a parent as well, um, about what is the long-term health impacts of their children being exposed to these really high levels of wildfire smoke, air pollution, while their lungs are still developing. Um, and that's unfortunately not something that we know very well. We do have long-term studies of PM 2.5 from other sources, and it, it's probably similar. But at the same time, what you said, Kai, is that one thing that is happening with some of the fires lately, so a fire that happened in my community, it was actually not much of a vegetation fire. It was a wildfire. It started on vegetation, but then it mostly burned homes. It's the burned down... It, the Marshall Fire last year in Colorado, it burned a thousand homes within a few hours. And um, the toxins that are found in that ash are very different than when you're looking at smoke from ash from predominantly vegetation burning, which is what we've mostly looked at with previous wildfires. But there's been more of this lately. These, I think we're, we have to come up with a new term for it because it's not really a wildfire when it's, it's, it's sort of like a huge conflagration fire it starts in the wildlands but it instantly is burning all of this you know man-made material that is very toxic um and we don't know the long-term impacts but what we do know for regular for just pm 2.5 in general there have been some studies that do show um sort of longer term declines in lung function um from exposure to higher looking at you know there's, there's one study that I know of that looked at um, college students at the University of California, Berkeley, some of whom grew up in Los Angeles in the 70s and 80s with really bad air pollution versus others who grew up in other parts of the state that didn't have as bad air pollution. And they were able to show that the students who grew up in the, their whole lives in really bad air pollution had much worse lung, lung function as young adults. So there is this concern, but we don't have the study specific to wildfire smoke at this point in time following up populations to see the impacts of early life exposures on later life health impacts. Thanks, Colleen. And um, I'm gonna read the uh, last question uh, because I um, apologize, I need to leave early before I, uh, I'm turning over to Sam. So the question is, now we've seen these impacts, right? Uh, first-hand experience or the, from the uh, um, health studies. So the question is, if we look at the future, um, we talked about the Paris Agreement 
the, the climate goals if we limit the global warming to 1.5, 2 degrees, 3 degrees Celsius. So what are the differences in terms of the Wi-Fi in the future? I guess we can you know, start with Jeff and maybe um, Colin can also follow. Yeah, the one study I looked at showed that under a moderate uh, sort of scenario where we work pretty hard to reduce emissions, we're only going to see a factor of two increase in wildfire smoke in the northwest U.S., but if we just kind of slip along and do like we're doing now, it's going to be more like a factor of three. So factor two versus factor three is a pretty major difference. And it makes every tenth of a degree we limit global warming is going to save thousands of lives due to less wildfire smoke. Great. Um, well, thank you all so much for your time today. Um, and thank you, Dr. Chen. I know you have to run. Uh, this has been really informative, um, and I'm so grateful to all of you, and I know that our participants are too. Um, I want to give a shout out to the Yale Center for Environmental Communications, who helped us host this. Um, like I mentioned, we will be posting a recording of this um, within the next week, and I will send a link out to participants. Um, I know also a number of questions and ideas came through the Q&A of, um, you know, maybe Jeff Masters writes a post about this with resources. So Jeff gives the thumbs up. So we'll make sure that um, you guys get that information that you need. Um, I, I'm super grateful to everyone for your time. I learned a lot and I hope that everyone else did too. Um, so so stay tuned for, for more from us. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. And everybody have a great rest of your Friday and a good weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.